My guest at this time is Matt Makoviak. He is the president of the Potomac Strategy Group. However, he also has a strong presence in the state of Texas, where there's a prominent governor's race and a very tight Senate race coming up in November. He was also involved in a special election in the 19th State Senate District in Texas, which was won by a Republican, his client, for the first time since 1879. So why do Republicans see this as a major indicator of what could potentially happen here in the next few weeks? And what does it tell us about the political attitude of Texas voters right now? And Matt, thanks very much for being with us. Hey, Greg, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, we don't spend a whole lot of time usually on state legislative races, but this one obviously caught our attention because, as I just mentioned, it hasn't been won by a Republican since the Hayes administration. So uh, Pete Flores is the winner. He beat a former Democratic congressman named Pete Gallego by six points. And uh, a lot of Republicans are seeing this as a critical bellwether, perhaps not just in Texas, but certainly in Texas. Why is so much attention being paid to the potential outflow of this result in this in this race yeah if you look back over the last year and a half um the the news on special elections has been almost uniformly negative for republicans either democrats are winning seats they shouldn't win in places like pennsylvania and the u.s senate race in alabama or if they're not winning they were making up significant margins all across the country including in republican districts and so that was building the narrative that this massive blue wave was likely to hit in november and obviously, we can't predict the future, but but we did have this shocking result uh, that I was involved in directly on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night, this past Tuesday, September 18th, with Pete Flores winning a district that Hillary Clinton won by 12 percent. Uh, and he won it by, by as you said, 6 percent, 5347, uh, 3,000 votes uh, separating first and second place. And so, you know, obviously, special elections are a little bit unique because they happen on a particular day in a particular place with particular candidates. Uh, but you know, I think this narrative that you know Republicans have no hope when the Congress is gone and when they may lose the Senate and they're going to lose seats all over the place, you know, this shows that in a Hispanic district, a district that was basically 60-40 Democrat, if you have a good candidate, if you have a good message, if you work hard, if you invest in your field effort, we did over uh, 30,000 doors in six weeks. We did over 100,000 calls in six weeks. You know, if you run those kinds of aggressive campaigns, you can overperform. And so I think the message that Pete Flores would have, and, and this is certainly something that, that Ted Cruz has talked about in the last couple of days and others, is we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to sit back and hope things work out. We need to go out there and win these races, and it can be done. Uh, Matt, we've talked to a couple of different Republican pollsters on the very issue you mentioned with the special elections in a lot of places uh, being disappointments for Republicans, uh, either losing outright or in many cases just not winning by as much as most people expected them to. And one of the things we keep hearing is, is that the Democrats are motivated. And they're getting pretty close to the 2016 turnout, which is amazing uh, to be anywhere close to a presidential election year. And Republicans are not simply matching that right now. What did you see in this special race? Uh, Was it a matter of the Democrats assuming they had this and not as many turned out? Or did uh, Pete Flores and, and your campaign strategy actually turn a lot of the folks that normally vote Democrat to vote for the Republican in this case? So great question, uh, because you've really put your finger on on, you know, why this race matters and what it can tell us for the future in in that very specific question. So if you look, so this race actually had a a first round on July 31st. and There were eight candidates on the ballot and Pete Flores finished first with 34 percent of the vote and Gallego got second with, I think, 28 percent or 29 percent. And so there were 24,000 total votes cast in that first round. Well, on Tuesday in the second round, with just two candidates in a special election runoff, there were 45,000 votes cast. And so if you look at Gallego, he went from 7,500 votes to 20,000 votes. He almost tripled his vote six weeks or eight weeks later. Uh, they, they, I think, were very pleased and thought, you know, if they were going to be able to do that, they would win easily. Uh, the reality is that, that we went from 9,000 to 23,000 and had a comfortable margin in winning the election. And so the point is, um, you know, we were able to cut into his margin in Democratic areas, particularly uh, on, in South Texas and in parts of Bear County where San Antonio is located. But even more importantly, we had a candidate who was, who was supported by the Republican Party and conservative organizations and unified the Republican Party, who had a conservative message, who ran on uh, issues that people cared about, property taxes, pro-life, Second Amendment. Uh, and we fired up Republicans. And so the counties in the Republican counties in, our, in, in, in this particular district were absolutely on fire. Uh, Medina County, for example, which is just a little bit outside of San Antonio, gave us an 80 percent, over 80 percent of the vote. 
it's one of the more Republican counties uh, in, in the state of Texas. But it, they, they actually turned out more people in early voting in the second round than they did in the entire election in the first round. So that's just one example. I think the point is, uh, yes, if, if candidates don't go to Republicans and turn them out and fire them up, uh, you know, hope is not a strategy. You've got to you've got to go out and do that. And, and so we had television and radio and digital ads. We did, you know, the phone calls, the door knocking. We spent we raised and spent three hundred fifty thousand dollars in six weeks. And we did that because we had a great chance to win. We had a great candidate. We had a great team. And so that, I think, is the lesson. There's still time. There's no reason to despair. No race has been lost already. You, if you put a strategy together, you execute, you stay focused, you go after the votes, you make the arguments. Republicans can succeed this election cycle. If you just look at the map, they need 23 seats. There are probably 35 House seats that are truly competitive. That means Democrats have to pick up two-thirds of the competitive seats. You cannot tell me that Republicans cannot prevent them from doing that as we sit here with 45 or 46 days left. Well, let's talk about one of the tight races for the U.S. Senate, and that's Ted Cruz against Beto O'Rourke right there in Texas, where you uh, not just uh, had, a, had a role in this state race, but you have a, a, a regular presence there in, in Texas. So you know the politics of the state well. Uh, it, it's an interesting year because Greg Abbott, the governor, is expected to easily win re-election. He's up by anywhere from 15 to 20 points. Uh, the Ted Cruz Beto O'Rourke race is much, much tighter. Cook Political Report just made it a toss up. We had two very conflicting polls this week. Quinnipiac has Cruz up nine, Reuters has O'Rourke up two. And it's also fascinating because O'Rourke is not doing the usual Texas Democrat thing and acting like someone who's not like the rest of the Democrats. He's for banning semi-automatic rifles. Uh, he's, he's not been uh, tough on the border. Uh, and he's uh, defended Colin Kaepernick, for example, three issues you generally wouldn't necessarily think would resonate well in Texas, but it seems to be a dead heat. What's your read on that race and why it's so tight? Yeah, great context and great question again. Um, so, you know, look, Beto O'Rourke is running as a progressive in Texas, and he's trying to prove that you can do that and still succeed. Uh, uh, it's been tried in the past. Uh, it's never succeeded. It's never gotten even close to success. And so I guess he deserves some level of credit for getting as close as he has at this point. Um, you're right. The, the polls are all over the place, and they've been all over the place. The interesting thing about the two polls you referenced is they're the first two public polls that tested likely voters. All the previous polls that showed the race close were testing registered voters, which is totally irrelevant. Nobody it doesn't matter who's registered. It matters who's likely to vote. Um, the Reuters poll was an online poll, which is generally less accurate. And the partisan sample in that poll was more democratic. The partisan sample in the Quinnipiac poll was far more likely to, to be to reflect what I think the vote will be. I think likely Cruz is up in the three to five percent range right now, realistically. But things are about to change, and, and um, I, I don't know when this particular interview will, will air, but if, if folks are hearing this before, let's say 7 p.m. Eastern on Friday night, uh, the debate uh, is, is happening at 7 p.m. The first debate between the two candidates is happening tonight. Uh, and so depending on you know who wins and, and what points are scored, and I think the interesting thing about the debate is Metro work is running as a progressive, but most of his supporters uh, sort of like him personally. They don't understand the issues you raised, but they also don't understand that he's for, you know, for sanctuary cities, he's open to abolishing ICE, he, wants to, he supports impeaching Trump, uh, he, he supports the $32 trillion Medicare for All proposal. Uh, he's very bad on guns. You go down the list. This is not. This is, does not reflect Texas. I've lived in Texas most of my adult life. Uh, it doesn't reflect Texas. And I think when you're going to see in this debate and the two future debates that they've agreed to, Ted Cruz is going to make Beto O'Rourke own his positions. And I think that is going to affect the polling, and I think it's going to affect the electorate. One smart thing Ted Cruz has done is let his supporters know very bluntly, this is a tough race. We're going to need everyone to get out and vote if, if he's going to win re-election here. But how much of the fact that this race is close is the fact that Ted Cruz is having trouble with the base? And I don't know if it uh, goes back to 2016, where he didn't endorse Trump at the convention and then ultimately did kind of quietly closer to Election Day. Is there still some friction uh, bubbling up about that? I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the case. That friction existed for two or three months after the convention, leading up to the general election. But a lot of that image uh, repair happened pretty quickly. And as you probably know, Cruz and the Trump White House have worked very closely together. Right. Uh, the president's endorsed him. He's going to come down and campaign for him, likely in October, with a massive, massive rally with a hundred thousand people. I suspect uh, I, it's a good question. I think O'Rourke is is firing up Democrats, and I think he's appealing to independents. He's done that so far. But he's done that really on personality and national profiles and this ridiculous comparison to the Kennedys. 
that kind of thing. It's, he's not really doing it on issues. I don't think voters in the middle want the things that Beto is for. And, and so far, he hasn't paid a political price for taking those, I think, extreme positions that are outside the mainstream of the majority of Texans. And that's the job the Cruz campaign has the last 45 days, is to make Beto own those positions, but to make sure voters understand that that is the choice. Uh, and you're right, Cruz has been smart and I think sober about the fact that this is a competitive race and that the biggest risk to him is complacency for, for among voters, among Republican voters. Republican voters turn out, Ted Cruz is going to be just fine. He'll win by five or seven or nine points uh, and everything will be fine. If they don't turn out, it's in the margin of error and that's when it's too close to call. Lastly, I know Democrats have their sights on a, a number of House seats in Texas as well. The, the, the two incumbents that, that immediately come to mind are John Culberson and John Carter. What's your read on how the, the competitive House races are likely to shake out there? I was just talking to someone who just looked at some fresh polling and all the congressional races. And while obviously some of these races are too close for comfort, I think Republicans are in good shape to hold these congressional seats. John Carter uh, is someone I've known for 20 years, and he represents two very conservative counties. Uh, just north of Austin. Now, the demographics are changing, but I don't believe that race is competitive. I never have. Uh, his opponent has raised over a million dollars with a viral ad, and she deserves credit for that. But I just don't believe fundamentally that that's really competitive. You mentioned Culberson in Houston. That's obviously one of the two districts that Hillary Clinton won, uh, where you have uh, you know, you know, semi-strong Democratic challengers. I think Culberson's going to be fine in Houston. Pete Sessions in Dallas is another. I saw the Trump Super PAC just put a million dollars in to help him. So I actually think the single most likely uh, result is that Democrats don't pick up any seats uh, in Texas this, Congress, this, this, this election cycle. I truly believe that. But look, these races are close, okay, and there are national factors that are affecting it. And, of course, you know, politics is interesting all the time, but it's particularly interesting now in the era of Trump. Things change fast. So uh, these guys, have a lot of, guys and gals have a lot of work to do and 45 days left, and we'll see where it all ends up. Absolutely. Also, just saw a poll that Will Hurd is up uh, by more than the margin of error uh, in his right. district, which is also a, a highly targeted one for the Democrats. So we'll be watching. Uh, congratulations again on, on scoring the upset in, in the state Senate race, uh, Matt. And uh, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you.